Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So, uh, cell migration plays a crucial role uh, in developmental biology and in uh, tissue engineering. So, we will try to understand what cell migration is, why cells migrate, what are the roles of uh, this cell migration and so on. Okay. So, uh, this is in general a very important process for both unicellular and multicellular organisms. For an unicellular organism, it is usually for uh, finding food. So, the, the cells migrate, they usually swim through a fluid, uh, try to find if there is nutrients which they can use, right. So, uh, this or it, they can also crawl uh, on a surface as an amoeba would do. Multicellular organism uh, also does cell migration, but for more complicated processes, it is not just for uh, finding food. Uh, it could be for uh, tumor invasion, metastasis, embryogenesis, angiogenesis or immune responses and so on. Right. So, if you remember uh, when we looked at uh, wound healing, so the aspect which we talked about was a migration of inflammatory cells, uh, phagocytes, macrophages and so on to see how they actually come to the site and so on. So, migration plays a crucial role in some of these aspects. So, the speed and the pattern of migration is actually determined by the uh, type of cell and also the chemicals are present in the environment. So, some of these molecules can act as uh, triggers or signals for directing cell migration. So, uh, the fundamental mechanism for forming structures uh, within embryo is uh, cell migration, right. So, think about it, you only have one cell to start with, it starts dividing. If the cells just keep dividing, you would just have a blob of cells, right, you are not going to get defined shapes. So, what is going to happen is these cells are going to produce matrices. Uh, and they are going to migrate to form different tissues, right. So, you know, different organs and tissues and uh, so because of this uh, during embryogenesis cell migration is uh, very crucial. It is also very, very well controlled and that is why you end up with two eyes on the place where they are and uh, a nose on where it is, right. So, uh, it is a very regulated process and uh, this ensures that uh, cell migration is uh, controlled. So, this requires cell migration to be controlled. So, development of tissue uh, structure and cell migration are interdependent, right. So, only when you have the cells migrating to a particular area, the tissues can start developing. So, people have used uh, magnetically labeled uh, oligodendrocytes uh, progenitors and monitored them using MRI to show that uh, the cells can actually cover a region of greater than 8 millimeter in size during the first day, uh, 10 days uh, when you inject it to a spinal cord. So, when you are talking about tissue engineering applications, cell migration ca is, uh, can be very important uh, because if cell migration is going to be there, you might have host cells coming to the tissue construct and integrating very nicely with the cells. And also in case of uh, angiogenesis, cell migration is required for vascularization to happen. However, it is not desirable if cell migration can cause uh, side effects such as loss of function at the transplantation site. So, basically if you have a uh, cell seeded scaffold and these cells are just going to migrate away, then you would have a problem, right. So, you would want to uh, ensure that the cell migration is uh, optimized. So, uh, can you think of a way you would uh, minimize this type of loss of cells from uh, a cell seeded scaffold? See if they are there properly. If they adhere more strongly, if they prefer to adhere to the scaffold compared to what is present uh, surrounding it, then they will probably not migrate away, right. So, optimizing the scaffold for cell adhesion can actually help in controlling cell migration. So, these are some of the cells which uh, migrate very commonly and uh, these are the roles when it comes to the migration. So, neutrophils uh, migrate for phagocytosis, lymphocytes uh, for destruction of uh, 
the infected cells, macrophages uh, in, uh, and for antigen presentation and uh, in response to antigen presenta presentation and endothelial cells uh, to create angiogenesis, uh, epidermal cells and fibroblasts uh, during the process of wound healing, tumor cells during metastasis they will migrate and neurons and axons during the development and regeneration of uh, nervous tissues and embryonic cells uh, migrate during embryogenesis. Right? So, uh, if you are looking to study migration of cells, how would you go about designing an experiment to study cell migration? So, uh, no, migration does not always happen through the blood vessels. It is not that the cells uh, which are adhered to a surface actually enter into the blood vessel and they are carried to some place. It can happen during metastasis in some cases, but migration for it to move. So, it cannot, it has to come from somewhere to the blood vessel if it is even to do that, right. Cell migration would have to happen, it can happen on the surface as well. Right. And see, many time cells are proliferating, they also have to migrate, right? Otherwise, everything will just be forming a blob in that. So, uh, what you basically do is you fluorescent label the cells, and these cells will be uh, tracked using time lapse microscopy or conventional microscopy. Confocal can be used, but confocal is usually more complicated. You can actually use it if you tag it with fluorescence, you can use simple microscopy techniques. And uh, what you would do is uh, you will see where the cells you seeded are and where it actually uh, is looked at, okay, how far it has gone. You can use sectioning to see how far it has gone and so on. Okay. So, uh, what is the commonly used fluorescent molecules for these studies? Not really. What is one common fluorescent molecule which you know for biological studies? Fluorescein diacetate. Fluorescein diacetate is uh, to stain live cells, but yeah, you can you may be able to use it. But the most common molecule which is used is GFP. Okay. So uh, lymphocytes and other phagocytic cells uh, can also be tracked using uh, MRI because they will ingest these uh, superparamag superparamagnetic particles. Right. So these are uh, phagocytic cells. They gobble up stuff, right. So, if you put a nanoparticle there, it will eat it up and you can track them using MRI or other uh, microscopy techniques. So, uh, when you are talking about cell migration experiments, uh, what you look at is uh, to introduce some kind of genetic markers uh, to the cells that can actually be tracked. So, time lapse techniques uh, can permit quantitative analysis of individual cell movements and uh, you, you might have seen these videos so in some uh, publications they usually have these time lapse videos uh, i don't know if you have none of you might have taken my immunology right did anybody take immunology here okay so you did okay so i'm pretty sure dr vani would have shown that video where a neutrophil runs behind a bacteria so <laughs> A neutrophil basically, there is it is a time lapse video actually, it is not that it is going at that pace, it is about a 30 to 30 seconds to 60 second video and you would be able to see uh, neutrophil uh, chasing a bacteria to eat it. And uh, So, you can look up such videos, uh, these are actually time lapse videos which is taken over a long period of time and you would many a times you would actually see a clock uh, which is running much faster than the actual time to show you what is the real time frame. So, um, the most common uh, migration assays which are used actually uh, expose cells to very simple systems compared to in vivo setup, right. So, uh, in vivo the uh, tissue is much more complex whereas, a migration assay if you are going to culture it on a plate and look at the migration it is going to be very uh, simple. So, can you think of a common limitation which you would experience with such systems? that is usually the major problem right so you most of the cell culture which is done is done in a 2d setup like only when people work on tissues they start looking at 3d setup so that is important because when you have a 3d environment the migration uh, directions also increase so you might have to observe things from different uh, angles so when you are talking about 3d uh, environment for migration Basically, what you do is similar to what Karan was uh, alluding to. So, 
So, you basically have a collagen gel on which the cells are seeded and uh, you follow the uh, cell infiltration into the gel by following the uh, leading front of the cell population. See, not all cells are going to migrate at the same rate. So, you might have a lead uh, cell which is what you would track to see what is the max, uh, what is how it is actually moving. So, this gives important information about cell migration. However, uh, this experimental system would have an important limitation. Can you think of any two limitations? Any migrating cells, any cell migration. Because of its 3D motion, the cell goes out of the focus. Not necessarily. You can, those are, I am not talking about uh, observational problems. I am talking about a design problem in the experiment. Just designing, how it But that is what is uh, supposed to happen, right? The ECM is going to have its own uh, barriers. So. Okay, so I will tell you. So, one thing is it actually is a very long process. So, it can take days for it to infiltrate and uh, monitoring it and maintaining uh, the correct environment, making sure the cells do not die are all quite big challenges when it comes to performing these experiments. And the other issue is uh, more of a proper design problem which is the leading front distance only gives information about the fastest moving cell. It is not the average cell population which you are looking at. So, whenever you are looking to collect data, you are trying to get something representative of the sample. This will not be truly representative of the sample. This will only represent the fastest uh, cell. Sir, how are these uh, fastest ones chosen? No, because that is the leading edge you would be able to observe, right? When you observe it in a microscope, you will just be seeing the leading front as it is moving. <laughs> that is all. So, see if, uh, if you were to have a fluorescent tagged thing and you are observing it under a microscope, you just look at the farthest cell from the starting point, that is all you are looking for. So, this is how a cell which is migrating would look like. Uh, so, what you see here is uh, the front region which is called the lamellipodium or the leading edge and the rear region is the uropodium which is uh, seen in the back. So, what happens during this time is uh, the cells can actually, uh, cells actually sorry, what happens during this time is the cells which are adhered basically start moving and they go and adhere to some other surface and then the, uh, and then they get detached from the previous site. Okay. So, once they have done that, they have actually moved one position. So, the uh, periods when the cell is moving forward in a straight line without turning is called as the persistence time. So, when you are talking about a cell migrating, the cells are not going to always move in random directions, right. So, they will continue in one direction for a while and then they may change directions as well. So, this time frame in which it actually moves in one direction is called the persistence time and uh, this persistence time can be altered based on uh, having chemoattractants and so on. So, if you have a chemoattractant, then the cells are going to try and migrate towards that attractant and uh, in that case the persistence time will be longer. Otherwise, if it is going to be uh, uniform distribution of the chemoattractant, the persistence time will be much shorter. Okay. The cell movement itself is initiated by active membrane protrusion in the lamellipodial region. So, in case of fibroblasts, uh, the leading edge of the cell protrudes and retracts in a cyclic fashion. So, uh, basically the peak velocity it can reach is about 50 to 60 nanometers per second uh, and it averages a net speed of uh, 5.5 nanometers a second. So, th that is the rate at which they usually move. So, during this uh, cell movement, a new cell adhesion sites have to be formed, right. Only then the cells can leave the previous adhesion site and go to the new adhesion site. So, uh, these are some of the cells, their persistence time speeds and uh, their motility coefficients. So, uh, what you can see is some of the cells which uh, are very motile would have lesser persistence time like your neutrophils or macrophages have lesser um, persistence times. 
So, especially neutrophils have significantly lesser persistence times because they just have to figure things out in the uh, region where they are right. So, they need to they cannot just keep moving in one direction. Whereas, if you were to look at endothelial cells they are actually not as migratory as these cells. So, they will have a much higher uh, persistence time and uh, whereas, if you are looking at uh, speeds obviously, the cells with lesser persistence times end up having higher speeds and so on. So, this is uh, the process which describes cell migration. So, this is a uh, repetitive process of lamellipodial searching for a new adhesion site. So, uh, the new front edge which is coming or forming will basically have to go and adhere to a new surface and once it is adhered to a new surface, the, uh, the europodial region has to get detached and it moves to the new site. For this to happen, uh, what would have to happen is uh, the cell would have to strongly adhere to the new site. So, the initial step is for the cell to stretch to figure out uh, what is the right place to adhere and once it adheres there, there is now a tension in the cell right. This is because the cell is stretched. So, this tension uh, could cause it to either move forward or move backward depending on whichever site has the higher uh, adhesion properties, higher affinity. So, if the cells have higher affinity to the new site, it will move forward. If it has higher affinity to the old site, it will move backwards. So, uh, this is something which you can even simply test as well, right. So, uh, like I do not know what are these jelly kind of clay which is called like now they are slime, yeah. So, you can play with that <laughs> and you will be able to emulate something like this. So, if you stick it uh, strongly at one site and you stretch it out and place it in another site, it will either come to this site or go to the other site based on how strong your adhesion is. Okay. So, uh, let us look at uh, some of the um, different adhesion properties of the surfaces and uh, how that would affect your cell migration. So, what would happen to the cell migration speed if your substrate has very high adhesive properties? Well, the surface in general has very high adhesion. So, because it is not like I am not going to look at one cell right. If I am preparing a scaffold with uh, very good adhesive, uh, cell adhesion properties, then how how do you how do I expect the migration speeds to be? It will be slow because uh, it is already adhered strongly it might not want to go to another side ok. What if it is very low? If it is not uh, adhered to the site, it means that it does not really like the site, right. So, it might want to migrate as well. It is not getting the right grip to pull it. So, that would be the problem. So, in the first case, what will happen is it will not be able to detach itself from the first site, whereas in the second case, it will not have a position where it can actually attach and move. So, in both cases, the migration rate will be very low. So, when it is medium, that is when you would have high migration rate. And as I have always said, biology always has some optimal uh, values, right? So high, low are never good. Something in between is where you are looking for. Okay. And uh, these predictions have actually been confirmed uh, experimentally as well. So when you are talking about cell migration, there are uh, two major types of migration. You have a random migration. So this is observed uh, for when you look at it for a uh, sufficiently long period of time. So, uh, what would happen is if you are going to observe, see we looked at the persistence times right. So, we said that the persistence time for uh, endothelial cells is 300 minutes based on the table. So, if I if my period of observation is only 150 minutes, then I am going to think that the cells are moving only in one direction right and if I am going to observe only one cell as well, like smaller number of cells that is going to happen. If I were to observe a very large number of cells for 3000 minutes, then what is going to happen is different cells are going to keep moving in different directions. So, it will look clear that it is a random migration which is happening assuming there is no uh, signal which is actually directing the migration. Okay. Uh, directed migrations are happen when it comes to uh, cells actually responding to their environment. 
So, uh, the rate of migration will depend on the composition of the local environment, uh, whether the receptors are present and uh, what soluble factors or surface bound factors are present. So, if the ligands are present in the on the surface, then the cells will migrate towards that and so on. So, if the environment contains uniform concentration, then the migration becomes random. right? So, if you have one region which is rich in these uh, ligands, then you might have a directed migration. So, uh, if spatial variations are present, the cells are actually capable of uh, detecting these de uh, gradients and changing their migration pattern to towards these uh, attractants. So, this process of moving in response to some gradient is called as taxis and it is critical for regulation of any biological event that involves cell movement. Because otherwise, if, if cell movement is always going to be random then uh, you would have very little control over uh, tissue development or anything right. So, it, uh, this directed migration ensures that uh, this is happening. Okay, so, uh, in case of random migration I had also put some term called Brownian motion. So, what is Brownian motion? Pa movement of particles in? Okay. Why would it happen? It is, it has its own energy kinetic and uh, it internal energies which makes it move and as it collides they change directions right. So, that is why it is random motion. So, that is why it is Brownian motion ok. So, if you observe a random migration of cells for a long period of time and you track the cells it will look like it is a Brownian motion because it will be quite random. So, basically Brownian motion is a solute particle uh, moves as results of collisions and their own uh, energies. So, the momentum is transferred uh, from the uh, from one particle to the another during the collisions. Particles move with a velocity, I do not know what V prime has actually moved. So, they, they can move with a velocity of uh, V dash until a collision uh, causes it to change directions and uh, then move with a new velocity. Let me just fix this. So, they can move with a particular velocity until some collision uh, causes it to change directions. So, otherwise it will keep persisting in that, that is your persistence time right. So, only when there is a collision there is going to be change in direction. So, that will affect your speed as well, velocity as well. So, uh, there could be momentum which is lost or momentum gained based on the velocities of these two uh, molecules, velocities and mass of these two particles which are colliding. So, um, collisions occur from all directions with equal probability that is what causes this kind of a random motion. If it is going to be in one particular direction then you are going to have you are not going to have a random movement right. So, that now in case of Brownian motion the time between these collisions will disc, uh, depend on the density of the molecules right. So, if there is going to be a higher concentration of the solute molecule there is going to be higher chance of collision and so on. So, the average time between collisions can be estimated from the average distance the particle travels between collisions which is called as the mean free path and the average speed at which these uh, are moving. So, the movement of a uh, uh, collection of Brownian particles is typically characterized by the uh, rate of increase in the mean squared displacement over uh, a period of observation. So, usually this uh, time frame for observation is much la larger than the mean free path interval. So, similarly if we were to draw analogy to our system your period of observation has to be much larger than the persistence time. If you are uh, so that is why I was saying if you are looking at 300 minutes and have observed it only for 150 minutes it is not going to work. So, the persistence time uh, has to be much smaller than the period of observation for you to understand random migration. So, uh, this behavior can be uh, characterized by a diffusion coefficient d which can be given by the Stoke Einstein equation ok. So, we talked about uh, how random migration can look like Brownian motion and what Brownian motion is, but uh, are the mechanisms similar ok. So, what would be the difference? I do not think there would be collision between yeah. So, it is not that the momentum transfer is happening causing the change in directions, but change in directions is happening because of adhesive properties and other things right. And the other thing is the cells do not this change in direction is not instantaneous. In case of molecules colliding 
you are going to keep, keep coming boom and then go out different ways. It is not this way, the cell migration is going, cell uh, change in direction is going to be very, very, very slow. Okay. So, uh, and also that is because it is not a transfer of momentum, but it is a sequence of significant uh, number of uh, events which include attachment to a new surface, a contraction of the intracellular fiber system and detachment from the previous surface. So, uh, dead or fixed cells can also uh, move because of Brownian motion. So, they will not migrate uh, on the surface. So, those would just be particles, right? those will be particles in a suspension. So, uh, neutrophils can actually migrate through a collagen gel 20 times faster than you would expect them to diffuse uh, in water. So, uh, although collagen is a much, much more viscous uh, system than water showing you that it is not that it is uh, going to be dependent on the momentums, it, but it has mechanisms to make sure it reaches things faster. Right? So, neutrophils usually are trying to attack stuff when they have to migrate through the collagen matrix. So, they move very, very fast in that environment. So, although cell migration is uh, similar to Brownian motion when you observe it for a long period of time, uh, the striking difference would be that. Uh, the cells can actually uh, move in the same direction at a nearly constant speed when you observe it for relatively short intervals. So, the change in direction uh, can occur randomly and this is completely stochastic in nature uh, and it depends on the membrane additions and uh, cytoskeletal uh, contraction events, uh, but substantial changes in direction occur only after small random perturbations have been ac accumulated. So, it is not like the cell which has been moving this way suddenly ch starts changing it and directions and moving the other way. It will then move slightly, slightly to another site, another site, another site before it completely changes directions. Right? Uh, so, in spite of these differences, you can actually use uh, mathematical studies uh, based on Brownian motion for understanding cell migration, for random cell migration. Okay? So, <coughs> so uh, in our department, uh, there is a Professor Murugan. I do not know if any of you have met him or not, but uh, he actually works on uh, not exactly on cell migration, but he works on aspects of uh, protein migrations and protein folding uh, using Brownian motion and so on. So, uh, if you are interested in understanding these topics, he might be a person who might be able to help you with that. Okay, so. Okay. So, uh, when you are talking about directed migration, uh, there is actually spatial variations of factors which regulates uh, cell migration and this leads to uh, cells detecting these gradients and changing their migration pattern. So, this process is called as taxis. So, there are different uh, types of taxis which you would have heard of, uh, topotaxis is uh, enhanced turning towards a stimulus, orthotaxis is uh, increased cell speed. Uh, when the cell is already oriented towards the stimulus and you have clinotaxis which is decreased turning when the cell is oriented towards the stimulus. Right? So, these are the four ways the cells can respond in the presence of a stimuli okay? and uh, based on what stimuli actually is causing the migration, the process can be labeled as uh, chemotaxis, haptotaxis or phototaxis. So, uh, chemotaxis is when you have dissolved chemicals, some chemicals which are acting as a signaling molecules and cell adhesion would cause haptotaxis and uh, light could be the trigger for phototaxis. Uh, certain agents uh, can cause chemokinesis and uh, uh, which is a change in the kinetics of cells random migration uh, that does not require a gradient, but will depend on the total concentration of an agent itself. Right? So, this is uh, in response to a particular concentration, the cells will move and uh, again we use the same terms like orthokinesis and uh, clinokinesis and orthokinesis is variations in cell speed versus clinokinesis is variations in cell persistence time. So, the pattern for the random migration of cells as we said uh, can be similar to Brownian motion if you observe it for a long period of time. Uh, however, if you if you look at it only for short periods of time, it will not be. So, uh, this you need to make sure that there is significant directional changes, so that you can actually look at it as uh, 
random migration as, as Brownian motion. Okay. So, uh, however, cell migration is uh, more is, is actually uh, a very good example of something called a persistent random walk. Okay. So, uh, what happens is at short observation times, the cells uh, seem to be persisting towards one direction and uh, for long observation times, the cells are uh, migrating at in random. Right. So, th that is what uh, is a persistent random walk, it represents both sides. Okay. So, uh, in the simplest random walk uh, what happens is a, pa a particle is constrained to move along a one, along a one dimensional axis and uh, in a time interval tau the particle can move a distance of delta uh, depending on the speed in which it is moving. Right. So, that is quite logical. So, at the end of this time period the particle will change its direction. So, this is the persistence time. So, uh, at the end of the persistence time it will change directions and go into something else. So, uh, it, the particle can actually go into left or right. right? So, uh, in an unbiased random walk there is actually equal probability that it will go to either left or right. You understand? So, I am walking towards a certain direction. So, so from here let us say I am walking like this and I would, if 3 steps are my persistence to walk and then I can turn left or right and I can actually either way is fine. So, I do not really have a preference and that would be a non-biased uh, random walk. So, at each uh, step a new direction is chosen randomly and with the particles history of the moment having no impact. That is quite logical, right? So, if you were to think about the cell, uh, if once it gets detached from the previous side, the previous side has no role to play in uh, where the cells are moving to, towards. So, if many particles move based on these simple rules, uh, at the end of uh, the first time interval tau, half the particles will be at minus delta and half the particles will be at plus delta, right? So, uh, if both have exactly equal, if all cells have exactly equal probability of moving left or right, then half would have moved left, half would have moved right. So, they would have moved to, so if center is 0, it would have moved to minus delta and the other would have moved to plus delta. So, the position of each particle after uh, n time intervals can be given as uh, x of n equals x of n minus 1 uh, plus or minus delta, right. So, that would basically mean uh, at 1, at n minus 1 this is my position, it could either be this or this, right. So, the, those are the positions I can be in after one step. So, from this equation you can actually calculate the mean particle position uh, using this. So, basically you have just divided it by the number of uh, par, uh, like particles, like summation of the, all the positions divided by uh, the number of particles, okay. So, now you need to simplify this equation. So, if you were to simplify this equation, uh, can you think of what would happen to the second term? Why? Yeah. So, half will be plus, half will be minus, so it goes to 0, okay. So, so uh, this happens only in an unbiased random walk. Okay, so, if it both are, uh, there, if there are bias then you cannot do the simplification. So, basically what happens is uh, uh, x of n equals x of n minus 1. So, what does this mean? Yeah, it is independent of time, the position of the particle uh, is actually not dependent directly on time. Right. <coughs> So, uh, all the average position is not changed, uh, the particles are actually spread across the axis, right. It is not that the cells are not migrating. For every cell which is moving uh, to the right, there is another cell moving to the left. So, it is mean distance from its origin is different, they have increased. But if you were to add all cells, that would uh, even out, okay. So, the mean square displacement uh, will give you the extent of spread. That is why you look at the squared value rather than just the actual value because that will give you a 0. Okay. So, uh, as the mean square distance uh, is 0 at time 0, the equation <coughs> indicates that the mean square distance increases with the number of steps, right. 
that is logical right. So, you, as you have more steps you would have more distance covered and more spread. So, uh, if the total time lapse just n tau uh, then you would this equation basically sorry uh, this equation would simplify to this. So, all I am doing is dividing it by n tau. So, the root mean squared of the displacement uh, which is x r m s is uh, given by this equation and uh, <coughs> you have d equals delta square by 2 t and what people have shown is experimental results uh, suggest that d for albumin is uh, about 8 times 10 power minus 7 centimeter squared per second d is the diffusion coefficient. So, uh, as velocity uh, between, uh, so as v is the velocity between uh, the change in directions during the persistence time they have a migration velocity and that would be delta divided by tau. Delta is the distance covered, tau is the uh, persistence time, so that would be your velocity. So, uh, delta can basically be estimated as uh, 2d divided by vx and uh, using this vx uh, of 600 centimeter per second for uh, albumin delta is 0.3 angstroms and tau is uh, 10 power minus 12 seconds. So, that just gives you a feel for uh, what this would be. So, uh, whatever we looked at right now was a one dimensional uh, random walk right. So, it could only move left or right it could not move front or back from one point it only did left or right. So, in a two dimensional random walk you will also have front or uh, back and other directions in the same thing ok. So, uh, so, that would end up with an equation of uh, square root of 4 d t and a 3 dimensional random walk will give you square root of 6 d t. So, uh, directed migration of cells uh, in response to a chemical uh, attracted chemical agent is called as chemotaxis. So, this could be a chemical signaling molecule or a chemo attractant a direction of migration uh, is usually towards higher concentrations of chemo attractant the strength of attraction will depend on the absolute concentration and the steepness of gradient right. So, your concentration has to be high and also in the region you know, where the cells are present if the concentration is low then there is going to be this gradient which will make it move faster. So, the activity of the chemo attractant increases uh, with concentrations uh, up to an optimal value and then the activity starts decreasing ok. So, Again, uh, chemotactic index is the term which is used to uh, characterize the chemotactic movement. Uh, this is just an equation which describes it. So, uh, so basically, this is given as d divided by l path, where d is the uh, straight line distance which is traveled through uh, by the uh, cell towards the attractant. So, if it, there is a chemo attractant the cells will be moving towards that and the distance which it, which it persists towards it that is called as the, is d and the l path is the total distance which is traveled by the cells and p is the persistence time and the correlation is t is obviously the time and uh, the this is the correlation and it can actually be simplified to get something like uh, c i equals uh, d divided by l path. So, uh, what do you think would be the chemotactic index for uh, random migration? So, yeah, it would uh, there is no real attraction, so it will keep moving all over the place. So, we are a perfectly directed migration 1 because your uh, d will be l path equal to l path, right. So, so the persistent random walks uh, with selected bias added to either the speed or the direction can be useful for studying the patterns of random migration in the presence of chemo attractants ok. So, that would be the directed migration and uh, simulations have actually been done to understand this. So, uh, however, it is still not fully understood as to how cells re recognize the presence of chemo attractants and what mechanism uh, the cells use to determine the direction of uh, the chemical gradient. So, uh, but this is not understood in mammalian cells, it is very well understood in bacteria and uh, other unicellular organisms. So, not all mammalian cells have been studied well enough to understand these uh, factors. Okay. So, some of the factors which can regulate uh, cell migration are 
uh, soluble factors, ECM proteins, uh, cell substrate interactions, even electrical fields have shown to imp uh, impact cell migration. Okay. So, uh, that gives an overview of what cell migration is and uh, the only aspects which uh, we still have to talk about are uh, reactors and how we use signals and uh, with that we will come to the conclusion of all the fundamentals related to tissue engineering. So, uh, we have how many more classes left?